you have admitted all Uh, yeah, yes. Yeah, can you hear now? Yes, we can. Yes, we can hear you, sir. Okay, good. So, uh, I think we'll start with the webinar now. I think most of the participants have logged in. A very warm good afternoon to all the participants of this uh, webinar. I <clears throat> welcome each one of you to this webinar on COVID, which will... Uh, I mean, we will be discussing the different, three different aspects of this uh, pandemic. That is the pathogenesis, the management, and its treatment. We are fortunate to fortunate to have uh, an expert panel with us. I'd just like to introduce them to us. Uh, Dr. Samir Melankari is a consultant hematologist and director of blood and bone marrow transplantation services at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. Uh, we also have Dr. Parikshit Prayag, who is an infectious diseases consultant in Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. And we have Dr. Sampada Patwardhan, madam, who is in charge of the microbiology department and the in charge of hospital infection control committee at Dinanath Mangeshkar Hospital. Uh, now I would uh, request uh, Dr. Janice D'Souza, uh, Janice Jason, madam, who is head of the clinical research department and incubation center at Mimer Medical College. Good afternoon, speakers and all of you. The latest issue of the Lancet Infectious Diseases has an article titled Riding the Corona Poster of Uncertainty. This heading aptly describes our current mindset. All of us are riding on this Corona Poster of Uncertainty. And one of the best ways to overcome this uncertainty is to share our knowledge and to fight this pandemic together. And that is the main focus of our today's webinar, COVID-19, sharing what we know today. <laughs> what is COVID-19? How does the disease begin? What are the chain of events that lead to the progression of disease? Our first speaker for today, Dr. Samir Melankari, will help us understand the pathogenesis of COVID-19. Over to you, sir. Uh, uh, can you uh, enable the screen sharing, please? Uh, so I'm not able to share this screen with you. Hello? Hello? Just a second, sir. We'll just do it. Uh, the green button should be enabled now, sir, and I think you can share screen. Just a second, sir. We'll just do it. Yes, you, you will not share the screen now. No. Uh, 
उनका वॉइस नहीं आ रहा कैन यू हियर अस नाउ यस ओके लेट मी स्टार्ट यस सर यू कैन स्टार्ट ओके सो थैंक यू एवरीबॉडी फॉर गिविंग अस दिस अपॉर्चुनिटी so myself along with my two other colleagues uh, we are going to talk uh, for the next one hour on uh, what you know about covid i'm going to speak about the pathogenesis of covid infection now we all of you are uh, wondering what a hematologist is uh, doing with the respiratory viral infection um, you know it's just that um, uh, as we go along you might realize that there are so many hemostatic and other hematological abnormalities in covid that sometimes you start wondering whether it's a pulmonologist disease or a hematologist disease also uh, some of us who perform bone marrow transplants after these you know we see a lot of uh, unusual viral infections including respiratory viral infections and therefore when we don't have a competent uh, id specialist we often uh, double up as a clinical virologist and that's how uh, hematologists have uh, gained a lot of interest in covid infection okay so uh, introductory remarks we know that uh, the uh, corona the sars cov covid uh, corona virus 2 belongs to the beta corona virus family and is um, uh, has a lot of homology with the original sars uh, corona virus and the mers um, um and you know in fact um the um the uh, the the spike uh, protein uh, is you know conserved in between these two viruses and uh, uh you know pe pe people who have and who had, who had developed a sars infection if they continue to have antibodies against the sars they are actually they could be protected against uh, corona virus because the uh, the spike glycoprotein with which the the virus enters uh, uh, the body is the same in both of them so uh, we know that it has a tropism for the upper respiratory tract and uh, there the virus undergoes replication and shedding and then it enters the lower respiratory tract then there is viremia and then there is an extensive attack on other target organs that express the ace receptor uh, the heart the kidney the gi tract and the vast distal vasculature that is your uh, corona virus uh, these are the important um, 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 antigens on its surface you have these the uh, the spike glycoprotein with which binds to the ace receptor the envelope uh, protein which is important for morphogenesis assembly and budding then the uh, hemagglutinin esterase which uh, is responsible for viral entry and egress and the nucleoprotein which uh, encapsulates the viral uh, rna the we know that the virus enters the enters the uh, you know attaches itself to the uh, ace receptor which is present on the cell membranes and uh, it, this is done through the spike uh, glycoprotein um now when the s uh, glycoprotein attaches to the as receptor uh, the s protein has uh, two subsets the, the s1 and the s2 and uh, these need to be cleaved and then the s2 is the one which uh, which internalizes which you know which attaches to the cell membranes and gets internalized the virus gets internalized and this uh, uh, you know uh, this processing of the s subunit is done by the help of a, uh, a serine protease in the cell which is called as the tempres 2 and uh, uh, so along with the ace receptor the tempres 2 helps the virus to uh, enter the cell when it uh, enters it forms an endosome like this and this endosome is then there is a um, uh, there is a hydrogen uh, atpase uh, uh, you know pump which sort of pumps in uh, H, uh, you know acidifies the uh, endosome and in the acidic um, environment the nucleic acid of the virus is then released and the virus the, this then attaches to the nucleus of the uh, uh, of the cells and then uh, the downstream effects are all um, uh, you know uh, they take place so the process of viral uh, spreading correlates with the clinical deterioration uh, mainly in the second week uh, following disease onset and the disease exaggeration is attributed to three processes first is direct viral damage just like in other um, uh, you know viral respiratory infections such as in sars or in h1n1 where the virus would enter the alveoli it would cause exerted cytopathic effects on the uh, cell on the alveoli cause alveolar damage there would be uh, you know uh, alveolar membrane formation ards etc and uh, so that is the direct uh, uh, effect on the lungs now um, when the virus initially came it was thought to be just like another sars virus and therefore many uh, clinicians made the sort of um, mistake of 
uh, assuming that it's, it's going to be only a single organ lung affection and therefore it used to be oxygen therapy and those patients would put on ventilator. Uh, but it was realized later on that um, despite that the virus was behaving differently, the, you know, the, uh, despite um, uh, ventilating these patients, using the strategies which one would normally use for ARDS, they realized that uh, things weren't working. Patients were not getting oxygenated. And apart from this, there were a lot of systemic manifestations which were seen, uh, which are not seen in the, the other, uh, you know, in, in SARS uh, infection. And so these are uh, the concept, uh, you know, these are uh, the results of the immune mediated injury, which the SARS, uh, uh, which the COVID virus uh, induces. And uh, the third mechanism of, uh, um, you know, of, uh, of, uh, of the organ damage is the unusual hypercoagulable state, which is uh, present in this infection. Now, the interesting thing is that the proportion of, the, of these pathologies is very variable between patients. So you can have some patients who have predominantly, uh, you, know, um, um, uh, you know, lung injury without too much of uh, immune mediated injury and without much of a hypercoagulable state, or you could have uh, the other way around. You know, so uh, why uh, there, there's a lot of interpatient variability. So when the virus enters, you initially have uh, the respiratory symptoms, right? Rhinorrhea, sneezing, then you have pneumonia. And then uh, as the virus goes into the lungs, you have ground glass opacities. And typically, and funnily, in COVID infection, we note something called as the happy hypoxia state, you know, where patients are asymptomatic. They, are, uh, they don't have much of breathlessness. But if you look at this oxygen saturation, it would be 80, sometimes 70. And uh, you do a, um, uh, you know, a scan of the lungs, you will see that the whole lung is flooded with the uh, ground glass opacity. Um, so uh, this is something a little uh, unusual. So therefore, scan, um, you know, um, imaging of the lungs is an important uh, sensitive way of diagnosing uh, this infection. And then later on, there would be uh, you know, viremia. Uh, systemic uh, symptoms would be there, fever, fatigue. Uh, cardiac injuries, hypoxemia, diarrhea. So uh, this is what happens in the lungs. When the virus enters the lungs, it, it affects the, uh, the alveolar type 2 pneumatocytes. And uh, you can see the virus uh, in, um, uh, in, 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 these, uh, in these vesicles. And it causes injury to the lungs. Uh, so the direct cytopathic effect on type 2 alveolar pneumocytes, uh, uh, what you see is about 20% of patients develop hypoxia and ARDS. Uh, predominantly, uh, there is involvement of the, sub, uh, the peripheral subpleural alveoli. The virus induces apoptosis of the type 2 pneumocytes. And then there is regeneration and repair process uh, during which a fibrin highline uh, membrane are formed. Uh, there is aberrant wound healing, which leads to scarring and fibrosis. And this invites innate and acquired immune responses. Now, coming to uh, the immune responses uh, to uh, the coronavirus. Um, as we know, you have T-cell mediated immunity and uh, B-cell immunity. When the virus enters the lungs, uh, it, it is first encountered by the uh, dendritic cells in the alveoli and the alveolar macrophages. These will then phagocytize the virus, break it up into various components, and a part of the virus component is exposed uh, to the su surface uh, in the context of MHC uh, molecules. These, um, these are then these alveoli, uh, these uh, macrophages and dendritic cells would then traverse and go to the hilar lymph nodes uh, and the mediastinal nodes where they would expose these um, viral antigens to the T lymphocytes. The T lymphocytes would then get activated. As we know, there are two types of CD4 lymphocytes, uh, the, uh, you know, uh, some which the TH, simply the TH1 type cytokines and some which simply the TH2 type cytokines. Uh, in coronavirus, uh, you know, the virus in, um, uh, incites a very intense TH1 type cytokine response where the pro-inflammatory cytokines are released. And then these uh, CD4 lymphocytes would invite, uh, would activate CD4, eight lymphocytes to come and directly attack the virus. They would activate um, um, uh, you know, more macrophages and, uh, you know, uh, invite uh, neutrophils. And uh, then there is a lot of uh, inflammation. Uh, the, the B lymphocytes are activated, and then you have um, uh, flooding of the lungs with, uh, with these cells. The B lymphocyte uh, response, uh, uh, so it usually you have a first flush of IgM followed by a longer lasting IgG. IgM peaks by day six, uh, rises by day six, peaks by day 14, and titers drop by about four uh, week or so. Uh, the IgG rises by uh, day 10 to 14, peaks at day 21, and long lasting titers are there. 
the antibody response uh, uh, is again first against the nuclear protein was seen, uh, seen as only as six days. Um, uh, neutralizing antibody to the spike protein is seen by week two. And the prim primary target of these neutralizing antibodies is the receptor binding domain, which is present on the spike glycoprotein. Now, interestingly, the magnitude of antibody response in the generation of immunity is proportional to the severity of the infection. So if somebody who, is a, who has had a mild infection, just an asymptomatic uh, infection, he generally does not generate a very high type of antibodies. But somebody who has, who has become hypoxic, gone on the ventilator, he is known to, uh, you know, if you check his um, uh, plasma, you'll have a high type of antibodies. Um, all right, now, uh, viral shedding can occur even in the presence of neutralizing antibodies. So, you know, uh, we have a, a very uh, prominent uh, hematologist who is at Dana Faber in, uh, in, uh, in uh, Harvard, uh, Dr. Nupur Rajesh, she's, from, uh, she's my senior from DJ. And uh, she and her husband both were infected with, uh, with COVID infection. And, uh, the husband had a very severe course, she had a milder course. Uh, but after they both recovered, they had, uh, you know, despite recovery, and they got back to work, but for several weeks, uh, they continued to have uh, the, their swabs positive. So they still had the virus even uh, with the presence of these antibodies. But the, uh, uh, these neutralizing antibodies will not probably allow the virus to uh, cause, a, cause infection again. So the virus just stays there and, uh, and goes away later on. So three markers of um, increased mortality were noted uh, in patients with COVID infection, decreased lymphocyte count, raised ferritin and IL-6 levels, and raised d -dimer. Um, lymphopenia uh, is, a, is a feature seen in almost uh, in most of the patients. Uh, although the viral gene is not expressed in lymphocytes, uh, the lymphocytes don't have the ACE receptor, but the lymphocytes uh, simply get um, depleted as a result of uh, direct and bystander effects. So they just get exhausted because of uh, in, in, uh, while uh, fighting the virus in the lungs, uh, especially the CD8 cells. And the cells undergo apoptosis as well as something called pyroptosis. Pyrotosis is 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 a is a uh, extreme form of apoptosis seen in a, a very in a highly inflammatory medium, and severe lymphopenia is an indication of severe disease and indicates poor prognosis. So this is a hypothetical uh, pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19 infection, uh, where you know uh, yeah, we'll probably just uh, skip this. Not necessary. Okay, coming to uh, inflammation uh, uh, in COVID. So there was this article in uh, Lancet where um, uh, they, you know, uh, you should consider the cytokine storm syndromes in any patient with uh, COVID infection and consider immunosuppression in these patients. And another one where, uh, you know, uh, in every patient with the COVID infection, uh, it is proposed that you must try and rule out something called as secondary HLH or hemophagocytic lymphoastiocytosis. The virus is known to sometimes, uh, you know, uh, incite a very strong uh, immune response and the immune response is actually what can uh, damage your, your organs more than the virus itself. So you must look at and uh, you know watch for such uh, uh, inflammatory markers. Um, so in severe disease, it is seen that you have increased plasma concentration of pro-inflammatory cytokines, including IL-6, IL-10, GCSF, uh, the MCP1, uh, MIP1 alpha, TNF alpha, etc. And uh, it is generally known that IL-6 generally correlates uh, uh, best with severe disease or least severe inflammation. IL-6 levels parallel the amount of inflammation. And therefore, uh, we tend to monitor IL-6 levels. They are, uh, they are easily available. Now, <clears throat> the CD4 uh, cells which are uh, you know, uh, affected in COVID, they become so abnormal, they become so pathogenic that they often start secreting cytokines which they are normally not supposed to secrete, right? So they normally don't secrete GM, CSF, or IL-6, but in COVID infection, they know to secrete even these. And then they invite, the GM, CSF will invite, uh, um, you know, neutrophils and monocytes into the area of inflammation. Um, and this leads to accumulation of all these cells and a rich inflammatory exudate, which then sort of uh, attempts to um, block the further viral spread. And this process, it uh, sort of, uh, it, it, it can cause uh, thrombosis. So these cells act as a, du a double-edged sword and also can they um, damage the alveoli as well. Now, uh, during pre previous pandemics of the SARS and MERS, steroids were not routinely recommended and they it was thought that they actually exacerbate uh, COVID-associated uh, um, injury. However, in hyperinflammation, immunosuppression is likely to be beneficial. And uh, this has been, uh, since once this was recognized, 
several lives all over the world have been saved because um, you must know when uh, uh, to use these drugs such as steroids and tocilizumab in IL-6 um, um, agonists. Um, and these can be life-saving. So all patients of COVID-19 should be screened for hyperinflammation using laboratory trends, so such as a ferritin, decreasing platelet count, CRP, or the HLH scores. Um, and you must identify that subgroup of patients where uh, immunosuppression will improve mortality. So a lot of trials are ongoing with various types of uh, anti-inflammatory drugs, such as the JAK inhibitors, complement inhibitors, um, um, IL-1 inhibitors. And uh, in anecdotal reports, uh, some of these have been uh, have proved life-saving. Coming to the last aspect of uh, uh, COVID, uh, you know, um, pathogenesis, um, the coagulopathy of COVID. Now, uh, it was noted that uh, there are, the, the coagulation system is highly activated. And why uh, was this noted? Because it was seen that patients with cardiac risk factors are the ones who die the most, right? Somebody who's over the age of 60 years and is asymptomatic and healthy has a less chance of dying as compared to somebody who's got extremely heart disease, hypertension, and diabetes. And why is this? Probably because of the thrombogenic state, uh, these patients develop sudden uh, ischemic events. Pa patients have presented with limb ischemia as a manifestation of COVID. We have noted that sudden deaths are becoming more common in the COVID pandemic. So a patient, uh, person just wakes up, goes, walks to the bathroom, and suddenly drops down dead. So these events that we know are more common, uh, are generally the cause of such events is, uh, you know, uh, ischemic events, either a cardiac uh, arrest because of uh, myocardial ischemia or, uh, you know, a stroke. Uh, also, autopsy findings document disseminated microthrombi in the organs in the absence of overt COVID. There's an exceptionally high proportion of aberrant uh, coagulation markers in severe uh, patients. And this was rare for in, the, in the other coronavirus infections, but has been seen occasionally in severe influenza. The coagulation secondary, is secondary to uh, affection of the endothelial cells. So the endothelial cells express the, uh, the AS receptor. So there is an intense endothelitis, and therefore uh, there is uh, thrombosis. IL-6 induces tissue factor expression on the mononuclear cells, and this also uh, initiates thrombosis. And the commonest lack of abnormalities that are seen in these patients are elevated D-dimers and fibrinogen. There is a higher incidence of venous and arterial thrombosis. So pulmonary embolism, strokes, uh, infarcts, uh, myocardial um, infarcts are all common. Now, there's a, uh, interestingly, lupus anticoagulants, which are antibodies against phospholipids, which prolong the uh, in vitro tests of coagulation. Uh, these we know have been uh, induced by viruses in the past, but the, uh, the in, in COVID infection, almost 5 to 10 percent of patients uh, develop uh, a strong positive lupus anticoagulants, and therefore uh, some form of autoimmunity uh, is uh, is generated. And this, uh, as we know, is an important cause of uh, thrombosis of uh, large and small vessels, arteries, and uh, veins. Now, thrombocytopenia is a very common manifestation of COVID infection, but it is usually mild and, you know, fairly constant in the 80 to 90,000 range. It does not affect the prognosis so much. Um, but DIC by the, uh, the International Society of Thrombosis Hemostasis, uh, you know, a frank DIC, which you see in uh, bacterial infections, endotoxinemia, endotoxinemia uh, that is not seen in COVID. That is seen in a very small number of patients. Um, uh, DIC would normally mean elevated PT, low fibrinogen, high D dimer. This is generally uh, uh, not seen. What you see is slightly different. Now, it was noted that a lot of patients who are on prophylactic anticoagulation uh, can also fail the anticoagulation and progress and develop uh, new episodes of thrombosis. Why does this happen? So, uh, this is because, uh, um, uh, you know, uh, because of the intense endothelial uh, inflammation. There are the development of these diffuse microthrombi in the lungs and other organs, reminiscent of uh, something like a thrombotic microangiopathy. But in the, uh, the usual thrombotic microangiopathy is the TGP and the HUS, where uh, you would see typical schistocytes, hemolytic anemia, um, uh, and severe thrombocytopenia. These are not seen. So it's not a TGP HUS per se, but it is just uh, inflammation related microthrombi developing all over the lungs and uh, other affected organs. And there is secondary consumption of the of the um, platelets. Um, and here, if you do a CT pulmonary angiography, you, it will generally be normal. So what you tend, end up having is a low-grade DIC, you know, just mild thrombocytopenia and a lot of uh, uh, microvascular thrombosis. Um, anticoagulation in COVID is not based on high-quality uh, trials, but uh, what generally one would do is if uh, the D-dimer levels are normal, then one would probably not anticoagulate. Uh, but as soon as you're admitted, 
uh, you would give prophylactic anticoagulation if there are mild symptoms. It's important to know that repeated monitoring of D-dimer levels are, are important um, to see if the trend is rising. Uh, if a patient is, is more sick, then you tend to give therapeutic doses of anticoagulation. And for those patients who are not settling with even therapeutic anticoagulation, then you may consider anti additional antiplatelet drugs or anti-inflammatory drugs such as uh, steroids, anti-complement antibodies, JAK inhibitors, etc. Uh, a word on why the disease tends to be milder in children, and um, you know, all the, as you know, most respiratory infections are actually much commoner in children and less in adults. But in uh, in this infection, it's more common in in, in, in the adults. It's, it has been documented that ACE receptors have a lower expression in children, and that's why probably the virus doesn't enter them uh, so much. Uh, the ACE receptors have a higher expression on well-differentiated epithelial cells, and you know the epithelial cells tend to mature with age, and therefore they express more ACE receptors, and that's probably one of the reasons. The children have uh, naive acquired immunity. So Th1 cytokine response is much poorer in childhood, and that's why this uh, modality of uh, you know pathogenesis is also less uh, uh, strong in children. And the simultaneous presence of other viruses in the lungs of children it tends to allow the virus to compete with them. You know, so that is why uh, probably this may, may limit its growth. So to conclude, uh, these are the key points that I wanted to um, um, you know bring across to you. Uh, so SARS coronavirus 2 uh, can cause severe disease in about 20% patients. Lung is the epicenter, but other organs are also affected. There is a direct interplay of uh, direct virus-induced alveolar injury, inflammation-induced alveolar uh, injury, and virus and inflammation-induced endothelial um, um, uh, thrombosis, endothelial inflammation and thrombosis, as well as uh, macrothrombosis. And there is an extensive integration variability in these above processes, and no uh, sort of uh, um, uh, you know treatment algorithm is uh, is can, it can be used for all patients. So you have to. Uh, see each patient, uh, see what abnormalities there in each patient, decide how to treat um, these patients. Okay, thank you. Thank you, sir, for your lucid lecture. Uh, please uh, disable the annotations at your end because some people are uh, marking on the slides. <coughs> I think we can take questions at the end, you know, let all the presentation yes, happen and people can... Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Our next speaker for today is Dr. Sampada Patwardhan, who will be speaking about diagnostic testing for COVID-19. When to test, whom to test, what to test, how to test, how often to test, and what to do with the test results. Over to you, madam. Thank you. It is indeed a pleasure to be a part of this uh, COVID webinar organized by MIMER and I thank the organizers for inviting me here. Today I will be focusing on the issues and challenges related to, uh, is my presentation being seen there? Yes ma'am, we can see and we can hear also. Okay. So today I will be focusing on the issues and challenges related to the laboratory diagnosis of COVID-19 and about the advantage and drawbacks of different assays that are currently available and also about the different strategies that we should be using for diagnostic testing as well as for epidemiological screening of COVID-19. So can, can you just make a full screen, ma'am, so that people can see a... Uh, this is actually a PDF, you know, so I think that's why full screen is not, it's not on the PowerPoint. Okay, okay, that's fine, sir. That's fine. Is it legible there? Uh, the screen is not very clear. That's why actually we were saying. Um... <clears throat> I mean, the way we can see it is pretty good, actually. Okay. Okay, fine. So okay, fine. Through. Uh, so before I really go on to describe the assays proper, let us first discuss about certain basic principles of laboratory testing of COVID-19. It is very important to establish a correct and a rapid diagnosis of the disease because we want prompt isolation of the patients and we want prompt intervention measures to be carried out as early as possible. It is also important 
for diagnosis of the patient uh, or infection in the asymptomatic high risk contact for taking the quarantining decisions so as to curb the community transmission of the disease we want laboratory diagnosis to uh, diagnose new cases to know the incidence of the infection to know what is the burden of the disease what is the prevalence of infection in the or disease in the community what is more important more than the exclusion of the disease the diagnosis it is more important to confirm the diagnosis and not to have a false negative report or not to miss a positive diagnosis because we are dealing with a pandemic situation this is very important to remember and for that matter sensitivity of the test is very very important and from epidemiology transmission point of view anything more than 2% of false negative is not acceptable so if we talk about the sensitivity of the different tests that are available we can be classifying them into two types one is the analytical sensitivity which is dealing with the assay it is the ability of the assay to detect the pathogen when present in the clinical sample and this has this has more to do with what target we are actually uh, detecting what is the limit of detection of the assay what is the sampling volume we are testing how well is the technique when we talk of the clinical sensitivity it is the ability of the assay to identify the patient's overall infected status that is the ability of the assay to detect the true positives or truly infected patients so here the what is important is when are we uh, timing the test when are we carrying out the test post symptom onset what is the disease severity and how well is the sampling done it is important to remember that the negative predictive value and the positive predictive value of any test would at any given time depend on the prevalence of the disease and the prevalence of the disease will definitely be decided by what is the uh, extent of the disease and what is the strategy of testing so this is the decision taken by different governments and different uh, algorithms are being followed worldwide but uh, as a uh, important point what we need is a test which would give us rapid results which would be very easy to perform which would need minimal infrastructure which should be very sensitive and fairly specific and should incur low cost Uh, before going on to the assay, it is important to understand the structure of the virus and its genome because most of these targets are used in different assays. So this is a positive sense vir uh, RNA virus, which is an enveloped virus, and the uh, genome, which is about 32 kb or 3000 30,000 nucleotides in size. The earlier two third of the genome codes for the non-structural proteins, which go on to uh, uh, which are involved in replication of the virus the commonly uh, used enzyme by the virus is the rna dependent rna polymerase the latter half of uh, one third of the genome generally codes for the structural or the accessory proteins and these structural proteins go on to uh, construct the virus which are the s proteins which are the peptomeres which contain the receptor binding domain which goes and binds to the ace2 receptors the e and the m Uh, protein which are the integral part of the envelope of the virus and the n protein which goes on to uh, encode or you know coat the uh, helical rna of the virus okay so if we uh, look at what different types of tests are available they can be broadly classified into molecular tests which are essentially the nucleic acid amplification tests they can be the immuno assays which are an indirect evidence of infection where we detect the antigen and igg type of antibodies and a few tests which detect the inflammatory markers which are associated with the disease so the nucleic acid amplification test the commonly used test is the polymerase chain reaction based test which is the reverse transcriptase real time pcr most of the commercial kits that are available are uh, are a open platform test that is we can run the pcr on any different companies machine like a separate machine or maybe roche machine or coagen machine so these are open tests then we have closed systems uh, like uh, one which comes from gene expert commonly uh, known as the express sars cov2 test which is a cartridge based nucleic acid amplification test then we have a test our own in house or indian test which is the true nat testing which is approved by icmr Uh, apart from these temperature uh, based tests so these polymerase chain reactions need different temperature settings so we need a high end equipment and a, a good infrastructure of the lab we need a machine called as a thermal cycler 
other type of nucleic acid amplification test which we can commonly use is a isothermal amplification test so these uh, basically are very simple tests do not need a lot of in infrastructure or they need a very basic uh, machine so uh, the types of these tests are uh, the rt uh, uh, loop mediated amplification test the common the use one in the us is the id now covid 19 by the company abbott or it can be a transcription mediated amplification because these are not commonly used for sars cov2 diagnosis the immuno assays come in different formats uh, they can be detected igm igg or sometimes iga they come as lateral flow assays elisa based tests chemiluminescence immuno assays or enzymatic source heat assays different tests which detect the crp ldh the neutrophile fill to lymphocyte ratio the il6 levels il2 levels il17 levels these are generally the inflammatory markers which uh, will predict the severity or the progression of the disease so we commonly uh, perform these uh, tests on covid 19 patients what is important is the specimen collection especially especially for the real time pcr because the quality of the specimen is going to decide the test result the quality of the test result generally what we use is a nasopharyngeal and a oropharyngeal swab it is important to collect it very aggressively you have to go well deep into the nose and uh, it should it, they say that the patient the swabbing should elicit tears and the patient should flinch if we are collecting a oropharyngeal swab it should be aggressively collected from the posterior pharyngeal wall and it should elicit a gag reflex it is very important to immediately place this swab in the viral transport medium so that the virus does not degrade and the rna does not degrade if we don't have the facility or if we cannot collect the np or op swabs uh, self collected saliva or nasal washes may give equivalent uh, results uh, uh, if the patient presents as pneumonitis or ards what we would prefer is a lower respiratory sample stool samples can also be uh, 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 used especially because stool uh, gives uh, long lasting titers and high viral loads so if uh, the respiratory sample test negative we can consider testing a stool sample serum plasma or whole blood samples are generally used for immunoassays so who to test so these are uh, definite recommendations which come from uh, the icmr so all symptomatic patients who are returned travelers from the uh, countries which no longer holds to now or they are returners from um, can i please uh, request the audience not to scratch the screen okay uh, so the returnees or the migrants who are symptomatic or symptomatic contacts of a laboratory confirmed case uh, confirmed case or a symptomatic admitted patient or uh symptomatic patients showing up severe acute respiratory infection as far as uh, screening of the asymptomatic contacts are concerned this is to be done between day 5 to once between day 5 to day 10 of coming into contact with the index case so there are definite guidelines by icmr about whom to test so when to test is a very important point we have to understand the timeline of the disease so as to test Uh, at a proper time and uh, to get optimum results so initial in the initial phase of infection we see a very high viral load in the nasal pharynx uh, and we get a positivity of about 80 to 90% on day 5 to day 6 infection the nasal pharyngeal viral load then drops and the positivity drops to about less than 50% after day 10 of infection as against the nasal pharyngeal viral load the viral titers in the lower respiratory tract are long lasting and they are higher so if a patient comes as a viral pneumonia later in the course of the disease or comes as a ards patient it is always better to sample the lower respiratory tract and a ball or a tracheal aspirate would be preferred as against the nasopharyngeal swab which may give a false negative result the adaptive immune response and the humoral response generally starts by about day 6 or 7 the the iron titers peak by about between uh, week 2 to week 3 and then fall to be negative at the end of say of 10 to 12 weeks igg rises later at about 10th day of infection 
and generally the igg titers would be long lasting for about 3 years so as for any infection we would say igm would suggest a active infection and igg would suggest a infection in the recent past or in a remote past so the diagnostic ability of any test would depend how on how severe is the infection then are we testing the patient post symptom onset what is the prevalence of the disease we don't want any false negatives because we don't want to miss isolating a index case and we also don't want to have false positive because a false positive would mean depriving a patient of his original diagnosis cohorting him or isolating him with other covid positive patients and then treating him wrongly on the lines of covid 19 which we really want to avoid so real time pcr is the gold standard test which is used worldwide for the diagnosis of acute infection this is based on the reverse transcriptase real time pcr generally the targets which are used are the enveloped uh, protein or the nuclear protein or the rd rp which is the uh, rna polymerase the s protein which is the spike protein and the open reading frame which we saw earlier in the genome uh, of the virus if you have to remember that false negatives are not uncommon with real time pcr because the highest sensitivity in the early phase of the disease with this testing is not more than 80% so the sensitivity will depend on the time of testing if you are testing the patient quite early in the course of infection say day 1 or 2 or very late after day 7 or day 10 the test is going to be false negative it also depends on what is the site of sample and how well have you swabbed the patient uh, another characteristic feature uh, which we are seeing with real time pcr in covid 19 patients is that they retest positive the earlier report is negative so remember that does not mean that the patient is reinfected it is just that we have missed the diagnosis earlier by real time pcr owing to its uh, sensitivity which is about 80% another important feature is intermittent positivity and a peculiar feature is that the patients keep on testing positive even if they are asymptomatic and look recovered this is because we have to remember that any pcr test is a genomic test so it is going to detect the rna of the virus and hence positivity is not going to mean that the virus is actually replicating and hence the patient may not be infected and we are really not dealing with a meaningful disease it is just probable that a dead virus is being shed into the respiratory tract and that is being uh, tested and we are uh, giving a prolonged positivity another point to remember is the current real time pcr assays are not going to give us a viral load because all of them are qualitative assay for the fact that we don't have any standards which are incorporated the quantitative standards which are incorporated into any of these available kits so just to go through the basic principle of what is a real time pcr when uh, we have a sample we extract the viral nucleic acid that is the viral rna and each of this viral rna genome is then reverse transcribed into a complementary dna molecule once this complementary dna molecule is synthesized by this reverse transcriptase each of this dna molecule is going to undergo a cyclical amplification exponential amplification through a reaction what is called as a polymerase chain reaction it generally consists of of about 40 to 45 cycles of amplification each cycle has a stage of denaturation that the dna molecule is set apart then we have a annealing step where a specific probe which is exactly complementary to the target of the pathogen goes and attaches itself there at the target this probe is bound by a fluorescent dye and once the dna polymer polymerase synthesizes a complementary strand strand on this dna molecule once it reaches this probe it will cut off that probe and it, it will elicit one single unit of fluorescence so one molecule of dna which is synthesized is going to release one unit of fluorescence so uh, needless to say when we have large viral load or large genomic load the fluorescence is going to be elicited quite early in the reaction and it is going to cross the threshold quite early in the cycle so at maybe 10th or 15th cycle only enough fluorescence will be generated if the viral load is very very high 
So this is what we exactly do in the laboratory. We have a real-time PCR machine, and this is loaded with these small micro tubes or the PCR tube. Each carries a separate sample or a separate genome coming from a separate patient. When the polymerase key reaction happens here, the fluorescence generated is captured by different dyes. And then it passes through a filter set with each with a different channel. And then this creates a graph of, of the on the computer. So you can see a cluster of different graphs here. Each is uh, pertaining to one different patient. And higher the viral load, earlier is going to be the cycle threshold or the cycle at which that graph is going to cut the threshold of fluorescence. So higher the viral load, lower is going to be the cycle threshold for that patient but it does not correlate with the CV routine. It does not mean that uh, higher the viral load or lower the CT that, uh, means more severe is going to be the presentation of the patient that we have to remember. This is a very useful idea. So the Infectious Diseases Society of America has come out with a beautiful algorithm about how to go about nucleic acid testing. So if we have symptomatic individuals in whom the pre-test probability of having COVID-19 is very high, that is, they come from a high prevalence area. They have a known exposure to a COVID-19 positive patient. They are coming up with bilateral viral pneumonitis. And if they test negative, then a repeat test is a must, especially the sampling being done from a lower respiratory tract. Why a repeat testing is must? Because earlier in the slide, we have seen that real-time PCR may miss an infection and we cannot have false positives in a false negative, sorry, in a high prevalence area. So it is a very important decision. So negative uh, repeat testing is a must here. If the clinical suspicion is low, the pre-test probability is low, the patient is coming from a low prevalence area, we may not uh, want to repeat the testing because it is the negative predictive value of the test in a low prevalence area would be quite acceptable and we may be really, really negative. As far as screening the asymptomatic patients are concerned, there are a few indications for this, which is which are given by the IDSA. But remember, our priority in limited resources is to test a symptomatic patient. So for asymptomatic individual in a high prevalence area, more than prevalence, more than 10%, if he needs, if he fits into all these indications, we may screen the asymptomatic patient or in some asymptomatic individual. But if he hails from a low prevalence area, then we may afford missing the diagnosis because it may not be of any uh, uh, importance from the epidemiological transmission point of view. So this is a very uh, easy test, which is commonly available in al almost all the laboratories. This is a fully automated integrated cartridge-based nucleic acid amplification test, which is brought by a well-known company called as Cifid. It has a platform called as the Gene Expert platform. This is the module in which the test is run. This module carries out all the steps of the rear of the PCR integrated in that. So what we have to do is we have to just load the viral transport medium 1 ml into the cartridge and rest all is done by the machine. So this is really a load and go uh, test. It can be carried out, hence it can be carried out as a point of care test. Even the ICU doctors or the ward doctors can carry out this test. It does not need a laboratory infrastructure. Rapid results are obtained and the targets are here end to end the EG. And what is the beauty of this system is there is minimal cross contamination and false positives are really, really avoided. So this is a brief comparison between the conventional real-time PCI and the gene expert. We have a real rapid result here within 45 minutes. The hands-on time is just one minute, you load the sample and then just go. And the cost is slightly higher as compared to the real-time PCR. And at, at, at any given time in a real-time PCR, we can uh, test up to 96, but here per machine, we can run only four. But it is a very simple test and uh, the targets are different in real-time PCR as well as the gene expert. Here only one SARS-CoV-2 specific target is there, whereas we have three to four in other uh, real-time PCR tests. This interpretation of the test results is quite complex in a conventional real-time PCR. As against this, this is a ready-made uh, result which is available on the screen with the expert. This is another test which is 
which has been endorsed and approved by the ICMR. This is a first line screening test. It does not tell us whether the patient is infected with SARS-CoV-2, but it definitely screens for the cervical viruses, that is the beta coronaviruses, to which the uh, COVID-19 virus belongs. So if this is positive, we may go in for a further confirmation test by a real-time PCR. But what is the um, uh, utility of this test? That this is a chip-based uh, test. It runs on the PCR uh, uh, principle. And uh, it is a battery operated portable machine. So we can actually take this machine anywhere on the fields, perform the test, and the results can be obtained within one hour. So we, we really want to screen patients while uh, you know, doing surveys. So uh, we can screen out who are probably COVID-19 infected and then get their samples in some high facility laboratory to perform real-time PCR. Okay, uh, so a few slides on the serological tests. Dr. Nelentri has already told you the basic uh, principles of serology. So in serological tests, we are, what we are getting to remember is the antibodies. So it is the indirect evidence of the infection. And since the antibody surge comes late in the infection, when the acute phase of the disease has already gone away, IgM would be a supportive diagnosis. It would be of real use in a patient who is really presenting late in, during the course of infection, and the real-time PCR uh, is a false negative because we are testing somewhere you know, on day seven or day 10. So here we can use IgM as a supportive diagnosis. What is the drawback of this test is they are very variably sensitive. Uh, sensitivity as low as 12% to as high as 85%. It averages about 50 to 60%. So we might miss, miss out on many infection. So sensitivity will depend on the type of assay, the time of testing, what type of antibody you are checking and specificity would definitely in about three to five percent of patients would be compromised due to false cross reactivity with circulating beta coronaviruses or maybe in patients who have different autoantibodies or patients who have received flu vaccine what is the real utility of the serological test is to carry out the epidemiological surveillance to know what is the disease burden what is the zero prevalence to calculate the crude mortality rates or maybe to know whether we have really reached the herd immunity level. So this would be the real use of the serology tests. Also to monitor the immune status of any individual or group of individuals, but there is still a query about the immunity licenses, uh, which they talk about. Uh, the tests uh, can screen out potential plasma donors who have been earlier exposed to COVID-19 and they can donate their plasma for convalescence plasma therapy. But still here we have to remember that none of these tests would tell us the uh, titer of the antibodies. So they are either qualitative or semi-quantitative. So we, for, if we really want to know the titer of the antibodies, we will have to go for a high-end test like called as the plaque neutralization assay, which cannot be performed in any of the routine laboratories. And also with many vaccines coming into picture in the preclinical or the phase one or phase two clinical trials, uh, the serology test would definitely help us to uh, incorporate the subjects into these trials or to monitor the response of these vaccines in these subjects. So uh, Dr. Melanthri has already told you about this. What is an important uh, point to remember when we are testing for antibody response is that the viral shedding may continue to occur. So that means the presence of neutralizing, neutralizing antibodies is not going to say that the virus has gone. And also we should be remembering that presence of antibodies is not going to tell you that you are protected from a second infection. So when you are going to give an immunity passport or immunity license to a person to say that he can no uh, join work or as a healthcare worker, we can join back. It, cannot do away with using of the PPE. That is a point to be remembered. Other things, I, I guess most of the things have been covered in the earlier slides. Um, okay, so the commonly used antibody tests come in the format of lateral flow assay. What we do in a lateral flow assay is that it is a simple card, a simple, simple cassette in, the, uh, or in which we put the patient's serum. If the patient's serum contains the IgM or the IgG antibodies, they will form a complex with a, a gold coated nanoparticle which has been tagged to the SARS-CoV-2 antigen, which could be the nucleoprotein or the spike protein. Once this complex is formed, it will 
by capillary action it will flow to this test catheter here are two bands which will capture the igm complex or the igg complex because they have the anti human immunoglobulin igm and anti human immunoglobulin igg so we will see the bands if the patient is testing positive this is the control line so if we have a patient who develops a igm band that means he is acutely or recently infected a igg positive only without igm would be a remote infection or a past infection and both together would be a infection in the recent past same format goes in for a microvel elisa we have a well coated with the sars cov2 antigen we put in the patient serum if the patient is positive we will have the antibody we will the uh, antibody will tag to the antigen and then we have a tracer antibody which has been uh, coated with a uh, uh, enzyme and and then we put a substrate there will be a measurable color change and we will know which patient is positive and which patient is negative so just a, a few slides on what is on the horizon we have a beautiful assay which is uh, coming up in fact in america these two detector and the sherlock assays have been us fda approved this uh, works on the basic principle of, of what is called as the crispr that is clustered regularly interspaced short palindromic repeat so what are these these are uh, short repeating dna sequences which are commonly found in bacterial cells and what do these do they are the uh, innate mechanisms which will take care of any invading viral rna and these crispr palindromic repeats of the uh, genomes are generally associated with a protein complex which are the cas or the crispr associated enzyme and what do these enzymes do they will literally chop off any invading viral rna so these uh, cas9 cas12 and cas13 enzymes which are commonly seen in these crispr uh, uh, genome of the bacteria are used to uh, build a in vitro test so uh, we have the detector uh, test which comes from the mammoth biosciences this can be carried out within 30 30 to 40 minutes initial amplification of the viral rna and dna and later cas12 well based cutting of the rna and uh, the emitted fluorescence will detect the virus the same thing with this sherlock assay and it is very uh, we feel very proud to know that our own scientists at the csi are based institute of genomics and integrated uh, biology have come out with a similar test called as saliga which will soon be in the indian market because they have partnered with the tata company for this and the cost per test of the company would be as low as 500 Uh, this test would require basic equipment it can be carried out a lot number of uh, samples it is rapid very highly sensitive and specific no specific laboratory uh, biosafety level requirements uh, this is a very complicated slide i think i would skip skip this about the crispr mechanism uh, so on the horizon we also have uh, what is really needed is we need to really quantitate what is the viral load so we want to know to evaluate the disease severity and what is going to be the disease progression so what we have now uh, coming up is a quantitative real time pcr kits with integrated standards for quantification or something called as a droplet digital pcr which can actually quantitate the viral load antigen detection tests not still available in the indian market but they have their own uh, drawbacks of very uh, low sensitivity and uh, the false positivity due to the circulating and pandemic corona viruses quantitation of antibodies would be helpful for to know the neutralizing antibody types especially for convalescent plasma donors so what is uh, done here is the use, uh, usage of plaque neutralization reduction assay but this is a very high end test involves viral culture and is done generally in a biosafety level 3 laboratory not routinely performed in laboratories like us and what is uh, really interesting from research point of view is the micro array testing to know the single nucleotide polymorphisms which might be happening and making the vi- making the virus mutate and uh, metagenomic testing to not only to diagnose the sars cov2 but also to know what is the concomitant flora the background flora these patients might be harboring especially in those patients who develop secondary infections so all these tests are really interesting to uh, understand and to know with this i end my presentation thank you very much Thank you, ma'am, for answering all our queries regarding the testing of COVID-19. 
high infectivity of the virus, lack of effective antivirals and vaccines, and large asymptomatic populations has made management of COVID-19 extremely challenging. Strategies to be adopted by frontline clinicians for patients with mild, moderate, severe, and critical disease will be discussed by the next speaker, Dr. Parikshit Prayag. Over to you, sir. Can you see my screen? Yes. yes. Sir. Okay, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for having me here. Uh, so I think my job has been made much easier, especially because of uh, Dr. Melinkiri's talk in which he went into the details of the pathophysiology of the virus. So I'll just try and explain what we've been doing over the last two, two to three months here in Dinanath and how we've been managing our patients. And based on the same principles that he told us about hypercoagulability or an immune storm or the direct effects of the virus, we'll see, we'll try and see what, what sort of therapies we've been using. So I think I'll discuss this in terms of, I'll give you a brief introduction of, of, about our own DMH numbers here. Uh, what kind of labs we are getting for these patients, that the direct antiviral agents, immunomodulatory therapy, the hypercoagulability in COVID, then the myocardial effects, the secondary infections that we've been see, seeing and what we've been doing for that, and some of the extra pulmonary manifestations that we've been seeing, and the long-term sequelae of these infections and, and what, what two patients and clinicians expect when they discharge COVID patients. So just to take you through our uh, numbers in brief, so these, this is our data, um, which is current as of last week. So, so far we have treated close to 500 patients here um, and almost 350 of them have been discharged successfully. We've had about 33 deaths, although we'll have to admit that, you know, there have been only 12 patients in whom we have fought for them on a ventilator for a long period of time. But the rest have been patients who have sort of come fleeting here or arrested in the emergency room and, and all that we've been able to offer them has been a dignified death, which also in these times is, is not something that you would see world over. Um, we've had 16 of our healthcare workers who have been affected so far and all of them have been discharged and are doing well. Um, it, it's a high turnover program. So on any given day, we get about 15 to 20 confirmed positive cases. And on any given day, we have about 20 to 25 discharged. So as you can see, the single day numbers look anywhere between 15 to 20 new patients and 25 to 30 discharged patients. Um, so let me start by looking at what kind of labs we've been ordering for these patients. And I think Dr. Melinkiri has always already set the stage for this. So for, for all the patients, the, uh, at, at, at the minimum, we've been get, getting their CBCs, LFTs, RFTs, ferritin, and CRP. And then some of the other markers, depending on you know the patient's finances, depending on the clinical condition, we've been able to get them. So let me try and explain what the importance of each of these is in terms of treating these patients clinically. So I think I'll skip some of these pathogenesis slides that uh, Manikiri sir has gone into the details of. So if you see, if you stratify these patients according to their severity, and this is data from our own program, so if you stratify them as, as mild or asymptomatic, so patients who had very minimal symptoms or patients who did not require oxygen or who were basically asymptomatic, then the severe category is basically patients who required some sort of supportive oxygen therapy. So these are patients in whom the resting saturation was below 94% on whom air, or whose respiratory rate was more than 30 per minute. These would be our severe patients, but they were not in the critical category. So the critical category means that these patients had multiple uh, multi-organ dysfunction or had septic shock or were mechanically ventilated or the patients in whom the PF ratio, the PAO2, FIO2 ratio was less than 100. These would be our crit critical patients. So essentially patients in the ICU who were on a ventilator or in septic shock or who, were, who had very severe form of ARDS, where are critical patients. So if you see in general, the labs will tell a story on their own. So they will show an incremental pattern or a worsening pattern as we go from the mild asymptomatic to the severe cases to the critical cases. So as you can see, I mean, ferritin, which is used as a, a non-specific inflammatory marker, tends to again show an incremental pattern. The medians, as you can see, are much higher in our critical care patients, uh, in, our, in our critical patients. What it doesn't really tell you is that whether this is directly an effect of the virus. So you would expect some sort of an immune reaction for most viral infections. In fact, for viral infections, ferritin would probably be on the higher side and for bacterial infections, CRP would be on the higher side. But so, so it's just looking at plain ferritin numbers, it's difficult to know whether this patient is in a, is in a cytotome or whether this is normal 
immune reaction. So it's difficult to uh, determine just based on the ferritin whether this is an abnormal immune response of the body or normal immune response of the body. And that's where you have to take the collective picture. So if you look at someone's inflammatory markers, if you look at their IL-6 levels, CRP levels, D-dimer, LDH and ferritin, if all of these tell you a consistent story that these are in the higher, that these numbers are high, then you would start suspecting a storm and then you would tie that up with the patient's clinical manifestations. So if someone is having high grade fever but is not having a secondary infection or is having progressive oxygen requirement with these high markers, then that's the time you start suspecting a storm. Remember, there are no real clinical cutoffs for distinguishing a clinical or a biochemical storm from the normal immune, immune reaction which is elicited by the virus. So for example, if you see ferritin, although criteria like more than 500 have been used um, especially for HLH, really if someone has a ferritin of let's say 700, it's difficult to see based on the ferritin alone whether this is a cytokine storm versus whether this is a ferritin which would be expectedly high in someone who has a severe uh, pulmonary viral infection. So again, you have to take everything in the context of the patient. But these are some of the labs that we've been getting. I think what really helps is knowing the absolute lymphocyte count and some of these ratios like the neutrophil lymphocyte ratio or the neutrophil CD8 ratio. The reason is that if someone's IL-6 levels are high, you would generally expect all their secondary inflammatory markers to be high. So for example, CRP or D-dimer or LDH or ferritin to be high. What really tells me as to the direct viral damage inflicted by the virus is some of these markers. So for example, if I have someone who has fairly normal neutrophil to CD8 uh, levels, and if he has very high markers, then that tells me that this is more likely to be a storm versus someone who has very high neutrophil CD8 ratios because that is sort of a surrogate marker for direct viral damage. So if someone has enormously high neutrophil CD8 ratios, but has markers which are in the reasonable range, that is probably telling me that this is more of direct viral mediated injury. So again, to distinguish between direct viral mediated injury versus a cytokine storm clinically and biochemically is not an easy thing, but that is something that we have to try and do because the treatments are sort of counterproductive. Because on one hand, you are trying to suppress someone's immunity if they are in the midst of a storm, versus on the other hand, you are trying to sort of use that immunity and give them direct viral inhibition if this is direct viral mediated damage. So I think clinically and biochemically, and based on the whole picture, it is very important. So as I said, neutrophil lymphocyte ratio, the higher it is, the worse it is. And this is not a new concept for COVID. This has been there for a long time. In fact, initially, it was used as one of the prognostic factors for uh, lung transplant patients, their neutrophil lymphocyte ratios for the respiratory syncytial virus. So it is a concept that has been floating around for a long time. But generally, higher ratios, generally ratios of more than three would indicate that this is a severe viral pneumonitis. Whereas the neutrophil CD8 ratio, which means that the ratio of the absolute neutrophils divided by the absolute CD8 cells in that patient's body, that gives you again an idea of the direct viral inflicted damage. So if that is very high, for example, there have been studies which have looked at this and have found that neutrophil CD8 ratios of more than 20 are actually indicative or even prognostic of severe ARDS in these COVID patients. So I think these two markers, if they are used again in the context of the overall picture, definitely help us in trying to answer this question, whether this is a viral mediated direct damage or a disproportionately high immune response or a cytokine storm that is going on in the patient at that point of time. And this is again, just to compare our own data with what has been found internationally. So this was the Wuhan, this is the famous Wuhan study that most of you must have seen by now. This one was one of the earliest uh, papers on COVID-19 patients. And this is a very descriptive paper. It was published in NEGM uh, at the beginning of the pandemic in China. And it contains details of, of biochemical as well as clinical details of more than 1,000 COVID patients from Wuhan. So again, if you see the markers, then they sort of correlate with what we have been finding. Again, low lymphocyte counts, low absolute lymphocyte counts, a relative increase in the neutrophils, a relative increase in the CRP, ferritin, and inflammatory markers, and increase in the D-dimers as well, and mild transaminitis. So again, once you have these labs with you, what you're basically trying to determine is whether the patient has direct viral mediated damage, or if the patient is in the midst of a cytokine storm, or is there a hypercoagulable process going on in the body? Is there a direct myocardial injury? Is there a secondary infection? So on top of the viral infection, do we have a bacterial or fungal pathogen in the picture? Or do we have any extra pulmonary manifestations in these patients? So these are some of the things that I'll be focusing on quickly, probably in the next 15 minutes or so.
so if you come to the direct antiviral agents and there has been a lot of controversy world over as far as the use of direct antiviral agents is concerned so these these would be our hcqs remdesivir favipiravir or lopinavir ritonavir so let us see what the evidence for each is and what we have been using in our program so again hcqs why did we even start using hcqs for sars covid the reason is that there has been in vitro evidence or lab evidence that it is used as an entry point inhibitor for the previous sars viruses so the, all the previous beta coronaviruses of the sars viruses have shown this property of being inhibited by hcqs in vitro which means that hcqs sort of prevents their viral entry and dr melinkiri was also uh, describing the endosome and how it is involved in the pathogenesis so again hcqs is something which reduces the acidity of these endosomes and and further contributes to viral damage so again the rationale is that either the viral entry will be inhibited or the virus will not be as potent as it would be in the absence of hcqs and that is the reason we started using hcqs so for those of who you must have used hcqs in non infectious patients so hcqs is used abundantly by rheumatologists you will know that the main toxicities would be primarily cardiac toxicity because it is something that can prolong the qt interval or it can also cause retinal toxicity or it can also cause hypoglycemia so patients who especially who have diabetes and who are on oral or uh, intravenous um, agents for diabetes we need to watch out for these toxicities however in the current scenario when we are using hcqs for about 5 days really these toxicities except maybe qt prolongation really are not a huge concern so i would not expect someone to have retinal toxicity from using hcqs for about 5 days you know you talk to any rheumatologist and they have been using hcqs for years in most of their patients and really haven't seen a, a great amount of retinal toxicity especially early on so that's not something i would be too worried about so the toxicities i must say have been a little uh, have been blown a little bit out of proportion to what you would expect but the main pro uh, question is really do we have any evidence for using hcqs so why we started hcqs was this small study at the beginning of the pandemic from china in which they showed that if if patients were put on hcqs plus azithromycin combination therapy so if you see this green chart here then the percentage of patients who became pcr negative by day 5 was definitely higher for the combination therapy so this is the green chart is the combination therapy or the green curve the blue one is hcqs only and black is controls so this was a very small study only 36 patients and what was missing was whether there was any biological explanation for using azithromycin so azithromycin does have some antiviral properties and does have some anti inflammatory properties but no one really knows why we are using it in the covid pandemic this is the only evidence that we have so far as a reflex action i mean we put azithromycin in patients who have atypical bilateral pneumonitis because some of the atypical bacteria like chlamydia mycoplasma legionella and so on are responsive to azithromycin so as a reflex we use, we put these patients on ceftriaxone plus azithromycin and so but the only real rationale for combining hcqs with azithromycin is this small study again it lacks biological plausibility as to why azithromycin is working and it's a very very small study of only 36 patients so personally here we have not been using the hcqs plus azithromycin combination therapy and then later on in the pandemic especially in the last couple of months hcqs seems to have fallen out of favor especially as far as international data is concerned so if you see this large bmj study again they showed that there was no difference in in the p value for patients who were on hcqs versus patients who were on placebo and last but not the least this was the real big study which came in jama last month so in probably the third week of may we had this big jama study so it's a multi centric observational trial in which they actually showed that patients who had neither drug hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin actually fared the best so if you see the uh, graphs here then patients in whom we used hcqs or hcqs plus azithromycin were definitely worse off as far as mortality was concerned compared to neither drug being used and this created a lot of ruckus especially internationally and most programs globally have stopped using hcqs except if the patient is enrolled in a clinical trial here in dinanath personally we have been using hcqs because it features in most of the national as well as state guidelines and so, and really honestly if you ask me the benefit still is definitely uncertain but we have seen very little and toxicity or adverse effects as, as against what was touted in these international studies so if you see this big jama study then the p value is significant for almost every side effect especially cardiac toxicity so abnormal ecg or cardiac arrest or arrhythmias or qt prolongation 
for everything the hcqs group has a p value which is significantly different from the non hcqs group i think this is a little surprising to me because in in in, in the 500 patients in whom we have used hcqs we can probably remember two or three patients in whom we have had to stop hcqs because of qt prolongation there are certain others in whom because of a lot of underlying cardiac disease or cardiac risk factors to begin with we have avoided using hcqs but i think hcqs toxicity is is a little overestimated at this point of time especially when you are using it for just 5 days so personally we are using it especially in the mild or moderate cases once the patient is in the icu and is in prone position intubated and mechanically ventilated hcqs has very little to offer because again the mechanism is trying to prevent viral action or trying to inhibit the early steps of uh, the vi viral processes in the body so trying to sort of cause endosomal dysfunction so again later on in the in the course of the illness it doesn't really have much of a role so now does remdesivir work that is the next question again internationally remdesivir seems to have found a pretty decent market at this point of time so this was the initial study in nejm which sort of prompted us to uh, realizing that remdesivir could be a potent agent again remdesivir is a direct viral inhibitor so it is a nucleotide analog uh, it competes with the atp sites for the virus so what remdesivir caused in this little study was that they took 50 patients who required oxygen therapy and showed that almost two third of them had um, a downgrade or had a deescalation of oxygen therapy so if someone needed high flow nasal oxygen that patient could be put on mask or if someone needed 5 liters he could be brought down to less than 2 liters so they had basically categorized these patients into six different criteria and saw that for almost 60% of them the oxygen category came down but this was just a very small prospective observational study of about 50 patients but one of the earliest ones to appear in any gm as far as remdesivir and covid was concerned with remdesivir we have certain concerns so it can be hepatotoxic it can be nephrotoxic as well so remdesivir comes in in a vehicle which is known as cyclodextrin so for those of who you might have used iv voriconazole remdesivir suffers from the same problem so iv voriconazole is is sort of used in a vehicle called cyclodextrin so voriconazole itself is not nephrotoxic but cyclodextrin is so the same uh, kind of logic holds true for remdesivir but it itself is not nephrotoxic but the vehicle in which we administer remdesivir is nephrotoxic so we need to watch out for that uh, again we are not very sure about its safety in pregnancy although there have been uh, quite a decent number of pregnant females all over the world who have been enrolled in remdesivir trials what the real outcome and real effects on the fetus are yet to be evaluated so these are some concerns that we would have with uh, remdesivir so after the nejm small study actually a big randomized double blinded placebo controlled multicentric trial from china which was published in lancet failed to show any benefit with remdesivir so if you see the p values here or the confidence intervals none of them are clinically significant so clinical improvement or duration of invasive mechanical ventilation duration of hospital stays or deescalation of oxygen therapy none of this was achieved by using by using remdesivir in this lancet study but the opinion again changed after we have this nejm study i think this is probably the most controversial study that nejm might have published in its history so what they basically showed was that remdesivir did not really change mortality but when someone was given remdesivir the patient could be discharged in 11 days from the onset of giving remdesivir as against 15 days when he was put on placebo now how to interpret this i think your guess is as good as mine do you, do you call this four days of shortening of um uh, sort of discharge as as beneficial i don't know but the problem was that in none of the patients who required oxygen they have calculated any of the p values or they have calculated any of the confidence intervals so this is only the overall number so overall what they showed was that patients could be discharged at a median of 11 days with remdesivir as against 15 days without remdesivir shortly we will be having remdesivir in the indian market so i, I think by the beginning of the next month we will be able to use remdesivir so i think it's important to build our own experience at this point of time right now in india if your if your center is in the part is a part of the solidarity study you will have access to remdesivir so solidarity is a who study in which they have four arms one is the lopinavir ritonavir arm one is the hcqs azi arm one is the remdesivir arm and one is the remdesivir plus interferon arm so if you are if your center is in one of these uh, studies then you will have access to remdesivir if you are like us who opted not to be a part of these who trials then you will have commercial access to remdesivir probably beginning of next month 
um, so going so so this is about remdesivir so again at this point of time it's all in the gray zone only time will tell um the same thing about favipiravir i mean there was a lot of favip enthusiasm for favipiravir from uh, the eastern countries so china hong kong japan which have been using favipiravir for influenza in the last couple of years there was a lot of influ- uh, enthusiasm for favipiravir and there have been two decent studies even one from the us which shows i i will have to say which probably shows better benefit and better conducted studies and stronger numbers compared to remdesivir but again availability in india and building our own experience is going to be the key so i don't uh, see favipiravir being used at least in this month in most centers in india so there have been other strategies to directly negate the virus which have been sort of uh, proclaimed by various people in the world uh, you must have heard of the famous bangladeshi experience in which they have been using doxycycline plus ivermectin and again there has been some in vitro evidence for that the caveat to this is though that this is only a bangladeshi experience there is no study based uh, on this so there are no real hard numbers for this so we don't have any p value no confidence interval no randomization nothing it is just you know a, a center in bangladesh saying that we treated 50 patients with doxycycline and ivermectin and all of them were discharged in in a good healthy condition so now ivermectin the problem with this study again is that you know when they used ivermectin in in vitro settings they used a dose which was almost 35 to 50 times higher than what we use for our transplant patient so typically for our transplant patients who have disseminated strongyloides or even for strongy prophylaxis what we use is about 20 micrograms per kg on day 0 followed by a repeat dose on day 1 and if needed another dose on day 8 so what these people did when they did the in vitro studies was they used a plasma concentration which would be achieved only by using almost 35 to 50 times this dose so if you use an enormous amount of dose in, in in vitro studies it is difficult to extrapolate that to an in vivo experience i mean i am not saying that ivermectin is useless all that i am trying to say is that it will still take us time and and more evidence for ivermectin to be used again doxycycline has been used for its anti inflammatory properties um some of the theories are that it is a zinc chelator so it sort of deprives the corona virus of zinc and it also has some anti inflammatory properties um again hard to uh, say either way at this point of time if you are using atypical uh, coverage for any other reason might as well use doxycycline because i think one good thing about doxy is that it has low resistance rates for most of the other atypical bacteria like mycoplasma or chlamydia or legionella and so on so again for patients in whom we have opted for an atypical cover we have been using doxy but not otherwise and again i think plasma therapy is is something that we would probably take up during the question answer session i'm i'm sure dr melinkari would also have his opinions on that so i think if you come to the management of hospitalized patients after the direct antiviral agents i'll spend about 5 minutes on the immunomodulatory agents a lot of enthusiasm again about tocilizumab and how much it works and how much it doesn't work i think the key to answering this question is is two things one is trying to identify the storm and trying to identify it early Uh, in the course of the disease again by the time this pa- these patients are in the icu and mechanically ventilated whether they are in the uk whether they are in a, in a, in an icu in new york or whether they are in pune really the mortality numbers are are very disappointing so whatever is to be done should be done early in the course of the illness so so far we have had many studies which have shown us that the sicker a patient the higher the il6 levels are but that is expected because because you know patients who are critical have high il6 levels but the question is that does every one of these patients have a storm and the second question is does negating these il6 levels or or in other words trying to block their il6 receptors does it do them any good so again as as i said most of the studies have found that severe or critical patients had il6 concentrations of more than 100 or at least more than 60 so that seems to be a good number to go by so about 60 you would definitely start suspecting a storm but as i said not all patients with an il6 of about 60 are going to be in a storm like state there will be patients in whom the direct viral uh, effects are also important so i think as far as il6 is concerned i'll i'll say this that you know it's worth trying when every ident- effort has been made to identify a storm with clinical and lab parameters and where you have ruled out secondary infections because remember you don't want to suppress or block the il6 receptors when someone has an active bacterial infection going on and again use it early in the course of the illness so beginning of hypoxia when someone starts desaturating or when someone starts becoming hypoxic you should use it do we really have evidence for that the answer is no in fact if you go back and see some of the mice studies which were done in h1n1 times then what what they did was they basically they divided these mice into il6 deficient mice 
and IL-6 producing mice and subjected both these groups to lethal doses of H1 and H1N1 and showed that the the mice in whom the IL-6 could not be produced actually had a similar outcome as to uh, mice in which the IL-6 uh, storm was pretty significant. So again, at this point of time, there are two important questions. Can we identify a storm and re really does suppressing IL-6 lead to anything good? It's like saying, you know, that low vitamin D levels can cause a lot of problems. But the second question is that artificially increasing these vitamin D levels, does it do in the patient any good? So it's that kind of a situation. We know that high IL-6 is associated with severe disease, but does blocking those IL-6 receptors do these patients any good? Again, practical considerations rule out secondary infections, rule, make sure that the patient is not cytopenic because you cannot use tocilizumab in neutropenic patients. And also make sure that you don't repeat IL-6 levels because tocilizumab blocks the IL-6 receptors. So secondarily, it can actually increase your IL-6 levels. Other immunomodulators that we have been using, so colchicine we have been using as a poor man's tocilizumab. So it is again, it, it can block the interleukin-1 and interleukin-1 beta. It can also block some of the inflammatory phagosomes or inflammasomes as they are called. Um, again, no hard data, but I think it has been useful in some of our patients, again, provided that we have been able to identify the storm. Hypercoagulability, I'm not going to talk too much. I think Melancholy Sir already threw a lot of light on that. So this is just one very interesting study from Italy. They found that of their 180 patients in the ICU, 31% of these patients had documented pulmonary thromboembolism. Uh, so the, I think this is an enormously high percentage. I, I cannot imagine any other virus in which 30% of the intubated patients have documented pulmonary thromboembolism. So again, as Melinkri sir mentioned, we have been using it in the prophylactic setting for most of the patients and in patients who have high D-dimers, we have been using it therapeutically or when the patient is in the ICU, hypoxic, intubated, and we don't have a contraindication, for, uh, we have been using uh, low molecular weight or even unfractionated heparin in the therapeutic doses. Another important mechanism to look out for in these patients is the myocardial damage, because if someone gets hypoxic, that's one more important differential to consider. So this is a virus that has shown to have a lot of um, cardiac effects. So for because of, a, because of a number of things, you know, hypoxia mediated damage or inflammatory damage or fibrosis or even direct myocardial damage. So you will see a lot of cardiac manifestations in some of these patients. So again, it's important to get an echo get your baseline markers and look at the cardiac aspect of the worsening in these patients. Secondary infections, I mean, in the last one month, definitely we have seen more and more secondary infections. That wasn't the case when this pandemic started. We, uh, we have one study here in which they showed that 50% of the patients with COVID-19 who died in an ICU in China had actually secondary bacterial in infections. And again, with our resistant flora, it would not be hard to believe that in a month's time, we would be dealing more with pandro resistant Klebsiella than with uh, COVID-19 itself. That's what happens with a lot of our H1N1 patients, especially who are referred from smaller towns to Pune. By the time they come here, it's the secondaries which are more prominent than the primary viral infection. And again, it took us a long time to find out why patients with H1N1 are more susceptible to Aspergillus. So again, at this point of time, we are only starting this pandemic. So in a, in a year's time, we might be talking about the secondary Aspergillus incidence in these patients. So again, something to look look out for, especially when you're trying to give these patients immunomodulatory therapy. So in summary, when a patient with COVID-19 becomes hypoxic, this is what I ask myself. Is there a direct viral mediated alveolar damage? Is there a cytokine mediated damage? Is there a pulmonary thromboembolism going on? Is there any myocardial damage? Or is there any secondary bacterial or fungal infection? Or is this a late worsening because of the fact that now the patient has antibodies? So we have seen some of our patients worsening on day 14 or day 15. That could be because of the fact that now the patient has started making antibodies and this is a little bump in the process because there is some amount of inflammation associated with these immune responses. Again, I'm no intensivist, so I wouldn't go into the detailed strategies of managing ARDS in these patients, but generally as a program, we have favored late intubation and using high flow nasal oxygen as against early intubation. Um, so I'll just end by showing a, a, some of the extra pulmonary manifestations that we have seen in our patients here and which has been described world over. So neuro manifestations, we have seen young patients with strokes. We have seen strokes in patients without underlying risk factors. At least four of our patients were almost comatose and deeply encephalopathic in the ICU. So again, there are different mechanisms. Some of these would be due, the, due to the direct dissemination of the virus and entering the CNS. Some of this could be, you know, uh, the virus going through the piriform plate into the CNS. 
it could be an encephalitis or it could be uh, some secondary damage for example there is something called as a cns cytokine storm so patients can have a pure central nervous system associated hyperinflammatory response syndrome again why is this important tocilizumab does not cross the blood brain barrier so even if you give these patients tocilizumab the cns storm may not be abated World over, there have been about eleven to twelve cases of GBS, uh, Guillain-Barré syndrome, which have been described as post-COVID uh, manifestations. Not hard to believe because of a virus which is so immunopathogenic. Again, is bound to have uh, these late sequelae or late manifestations. And again, critical illness, myeloneuropathy, as you would expect in many of our ICU patients. Melinkiri sir talked about the uh, ACE receptors in in for these viruses. So again, kidneys are places where you have a high amount of ACE receptors. Which have also a, a very good blood supply. So we have been increasingly seeing more and more renal manifestations and and more acute kidney injuries. Probably these are direct interstitial uh, nephritis-like manifestations. I was just talking with Sampana Ma'am the other day. It's difficult to get biopsies in these patients. So we'll probably try and send urine PCRs in the next uh, few weeks to see if that is any good as far as diagnosing you know direct interstitial nephritis is concerned. We talked about cardiac manifestations. GI manifestations again. It is a G GI tropic virus. If you if you see the whole coronavirus family, it has a high amount of GI tropism. So we have been seeing a decent amount of GI manifestations. Uh, I've had four patients with unexplained pancreatitis. You know who are recovered sort of day seven, day eight in their COVID course, who were non-alcoholics, did not have stones, were not on thiazide diuretics, did not have any other risk factors for pancreatitis, and developed. Um, acute pancreatitis. So again, we will know more of these extrapulmonary manifestations as the pandemic progresses. And again, just my last slide. So um, when we are trying to discharge patients, is repeat testing required? Um, we heard an excellent presentation by Ma'am on the on PCRs. So as as a policy, we are not doing repeat testing. Uh, it's a clinical decision. Post discharge, these patients must be isolated for at least seven days, and these are government guidelines at this point of time. We are generally putting these patients on aspirin for a month because the hypercoagulable state can last for quite a few days because of inflammation and endothelial mediated damage. So most of the patients, unless contraindicated, we are putting them uh, on antiplatelet therapy for at least a month. Um, and then follow up is crucial. We have been electronically following up with these patients to uh, sort of identify some of these late sequelae uh, because there are a lot of late sequelae, not just neurological. So in terms of strokes or GBS or immunomediated phenomenon. Or late pulmonary sequelae like pulmonary fibrosis, uh, venous thromboembolisms, myocardial damage, late psychiatric sequelae. So it's a harrowing experience for the patients to go through the COVID wards, you know, without families. So again, some of these late sequelae are also psychiatric. So this is, these are all the kinds of things to look out for when these patients uh, fall up at uh, your clinic after COVID. So again, briefly, I think for mild patients, you know, HCQS prophylactic heparin and symptomatic therapy. For severe patients, I think severe patients early in the course are those which benefit from immunomodulators the most, and not the critical ones. So, again, direct antiviral agents, immunomodulators, identifying a storm, ruling out secondary infections, and looking at the hypercoagulable uh, profiles. And then for critical patients, unfortunately, it's, it's all about their ARDS management, management of secondary infections, or maybe therapeutic heparin if indicated. Immunomodulation seems to play less of a role because you know. Whether it's virus-mediated damage or cytokine-mediated damage, the damage has already been done. So uh, there has already been apoptosis at the alveolar level by the time these patients are intubated and in prone positions. So I think that is not really the time to consider tocilizumab. In fact, it could even be worsening their secondary uh, ventilator-associated pneumonias or or hospital-acquired infections. So this is a very um, brief summary of what we have been trying to do. Again, these are our COVID warriors at Dinanath, um, and again, thank you for your attention. I think we'll be happy to take questions now. Thank you, sir, for sharing your experiences with us. We now move on to the Q and A session. Dr. Sandesh, you can start with the questions. Uh, good evening, everybody. Now we are actually proceeding to the question and answer sessions. So we have some questions uh, for all the speakers, actually. So first question, I think, so to uh, Dr. Melinkari about the who actually spoke about the pathogenesis of uh, COVID-19. Sir, we have a question that how these SARS-CoV-2 differ from other coronaviruses, and why the infectivity is such a high uh, with this uh, COVID-2? Uh, the simple answer is we don't know. 
<laughs> we don't know what it, what it is in this virus that incites such a different kind of a response. You know, despite having a approximately 80% homology with the SARS uh, virus, uh, why this one incites such a bad antigenic response uh, is probably under investigation. That's all I would say. Okay. Uh, sir, another question for you only. Uh, does all corona family actually cause coagulopathy uh, when uh, you get infections or this is the only uh, seen in uh, COVID-2? This is typically seen in COVID-2. Uh, occasional in, in, in severe influenza infections this has been seen. Uh, but this is uh, something which has been discovered only with, co with, uh, with COVID-2. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, next question I would like to ask to Sampada, madam. Actually, this is from our pathology department. Uh, so we have a question, ma'am, that we our lab has got a sample retention policy. So is it necessary to change the policy and discard the samples earlier, uh, considering the COVID scenario? Uh, there are ICMR guidelines that we have to retain the sample, all samples that are tested for in the future for period of seven days, and then discard. We, we can't hear, ma'am. Can you be just a little bit louder? There is a guideline by ICMR that all samples that are tested by real-time PCR need to be retained for seven days and then they have to be disposed of with the standard biomedical precautions that have been uh, told for COVID-19 by ICMR. And uh, all positive samples, we have been, we have a directive from the NIV that we should be sending them, that is what we are doing in our laboratory. So we send all positive tested samples to NIV for uh, uh, archiving there. We are having a repository there. Okay. This is what we are following. It in our okay. okay. This one more question, ma'am, for you only. Uh, there are different guidelines from the government about testing of COVID. Mm -hmm. And sometimes the clinicians don't agree with the government guidelines. As like all the hospitals basically mm -hmm. are preferring to test all the patients admitted some hospitals where there are less cases maybe, or maybe we consider as um, green zones or orange zones, they are testing the patients who are undergo surgery. Hmm. All patients. So is there any, um, like, uh, can you put a little bit light on uh, this particular aspect that which patient should be tested really, or uh, we should just follow the government guidelines as of now? See, I, I really don't know because this is a very uh, disputed uh, thing with various uh, uh, protocols being followed. But what we are following in our institute is that we are screening the patients in the fever OPD and all symptomatics. I showed you the slide of ICMR guidelines in to test. So we are exactly following that. And uh, we are like for a symptomatic screening also, uh, it's not a policy followed at DMH. So no preoperative screening for Okay, so all pre-operatives, you are not doing a COVID testing. Only symptomatic patients and suspected patients only, you are doing COVID testing. And asymptomatic and symptomatic contacts of the industry. Okay, and contacts you guys are testing. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, one more question for you, actually. Yes. There was something in the news and even uh, a, probably a paper published related to a Vidal testing in um, COVID patients. As a, as a screening test. So there was some uh, one, one person from Thane or like Maharashtra only who has actually written something on this and it was in the news that Vidal testing, if comes positive, can be taken as a screening test and then can be tested for COVID. So do you have some idea or clue about uh, this particular thing? What does salmonella type you have to do with COVID-19? It's a bacterium, which is a virus. Vidal is... Uh, maybe as you would say some false positive IgG response, some anamnestic response. So still it is a very hard to believe uh, Panda that any COVID-19 positive patient would give a false positive without diabetes. So, okay. yeah. One more question ma'am. Uh, what is the role of this rapid antibody testing in management of these COVID patients at present? Because we are doing PCR for diagnosing but then what is the exact role of this rapid testing? Because some people are preferring that because of maybe low cost. Okay. Uh, as I told, earlier told you, told in my slides, these tests have a compromised sensitivity that we have to remember. Fairly good specificity. And these would be of use in the later uh, phase of the disease. Maybe when the PCR test false negative, 
maybe after day seven or day ten, and we have a pre high pre-test probability of uh, having infection, and then we can use a IgM test. But uh, let me here again um, stress the fact that ICMR is not approving antibody testing. They have been saying this again and again, and uh, so we are not doing antibody testing at our hospital. The diagnosis is solely based on real-time PCR positivity. Or maybe a repeat testing in highly suspected patients. And the last question for you, ma'am. Um, once get, got infected and you got antibodies against this coronavirus, does it provide an immunity for you for some time or a lifelong? Or is there any yeah, data available? Yes, the antibodies would circulate. So we know that uh, the antibodies are neutralizing antibodies, the IgA and the IgG type. So they might neutralize the S protein and may inhibit binding. But uh, there, is no, there, are, there is no concrete evidence that this may really protect you from a secondary infection. Maybe, maybe the second infection may be a milder one. But there is no, uh, Dr. Melanchthon wants to answer this yeah, question. Just make a comment on this. Uh, you know, in the uh, in the original SARS, uh, it was noted that antibodies uh, in about 50% patients lasted for uh, something like uh, 16 to 18 months. And uh, beyond two years, they actually dropped down to, you know, so long lasting uh, titers were seen in about 8 to 9% patients only. So those who had SARS 17 years ago, right now, if you test for the antibodies, only about 8 to 9% uh, had, uh, you know, existing at the two low level, low titers of antibodies. So. For uh, COVID, uh, we really don't know. We have to wait and see what happens, how long the antibody response will last. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, the next question is to Dr. Prayag, sir. Uh, yes. Sir, you mentioned about few antiviral drugs. Uh, we have got actually very good results uh, uh, on international studies, actually. Flavipiravir and Amdesivir. But we are not having these drugs right now in hand. So which are the antivirals preferably used uh, in DMH by you right now? For treating the patient. So right now we are using HCQS uh, because it's, it's a part of uh, various uh, recommendations in India. But apart from that, we are not using any specific antiviral therapy at this point of time. Um, again, in probably in the next month or so, we will have Remdesivir because it's commercially going to be launched at the end of this month. Um, at the, at right now, it's it's only for government-approved usage. So if you want to use Remdesivir at this point of time. You need to apply to the government and they may or may not sanction it for usage. Or the other way to use it would be if you are a, a part of the solidarity trial that I mentioned. So WHO has a trial going on which has four arms and one of the arms is the Remdesivir arm. So those are the only ways in which you can get it right now. Okay. Okay. Uh, so one more uh, question. Now these two drugs, Remdesivir, basically was used for Ebola and uh, again Flavipiravir for influenza infections. And if we are both are available, which one will be better? And at what stage, basically, we should start antivirals? Like mild symptoms, should we start with antivirals or only critical patients will uh, should receive the antivirals? So I think it, it would be beneficial to start it earlier because, you know, as we have seen, the pathogenesis of this, this virus is different. By the time the patients worsen, there are a lot of things going on, like probably cytokine storms or immune-mediated damage or hypercoagulability and so on. So I think definitely better to use it earlier on. Again, depends on what kind of antiviral you are using. So for example, HCQS definitely makes sense to use it earlier on. It, it again depends on the mechanism of action. But as a, as a rule, the earlier, the better. Between Remdesivir and Fivipiravir, very difficult to say if at all anything is working and which is better. At this point of time, the data is weak for both of them. Uh, so probably in a month or so, not a month or so, probably in the next six months or so, you would be in a better position to answer this question. Okay, sir, can you uh, would like to talk about something about vaccination uh, about uh, this particular disease? Uh, any any um, uh, literature or something which is uh, probably arriving uh, with India? So you mean uh, vaccine used as a so other vaccines like BCG as a treatment for COVID or COVID vaccine? COVID, COVID vaccine, sir, I am talking about. Okay, COVID vaccine, right? So I mean, there have been uh, very optimistic reports. I was just reading that we might have an intranasal vaccine by the end of August or the Oxford vaccine in the next six months. I don't know. I mean, it's difficult. They are, they, are, they are just starting phase three studies on these vaccines. And again, the antigenicity is not fully known at this point of time. So we'll have to wait and see. I, I personally find it a little hard to believe the reports that we might have vaccines in the next couple of months. I think it's going to be at least six months before we have the vaccine. Okay. So even in your slide, we saw uh, in the management actually about late intubation. 
so um, we just want to know why late intubation and there is something which is even called as prone ventilation some people are trying which is helping in management of these patients so uh, can you uh, would like to talk something about this yeah so awake pruning definitely in, uh, has has helped us you know there is no doubt about it like intubated or even patients in the ward who have been pruned have definitely done well uh, as far as late intubation is concerned you know i think it really depends on the individual program for example in program and again i'm not an intensive but i can give you my take on this so in programs which have opted for early intubation these might be programs in whom the icu monitoring may not be that great 24/7 Whereas here we have continuous intensive is twenty four seven. So really, we the threshold for deciding intubation can be assessed twenty four seven. The other part of the story is that you know HFNO, which looked a little, uh, which didn't look that great at the beginning. I mean, there is now conflicting data on that. So if you see ANZIC or the Australian New Zealand Intensive Care Society or even the Asia Pacific Society now, they are definitely promoting um, HFNO as as uh, a therapy for these patients. So again. trying to minimize secondary infections and the fact that we have a 24/7 support wherein we can intubate patients on the spot um and the increasingly decent experience with hfno i think are the reasons why we are going for late intubation okay thank you so much sir for the um, answers actually uh, the all the speakers uh, we you actually enlightened a knowledge on covid a recent disease and a pandemic which we are facing and these are few questions actually there are maybe many questions uh, with the audience we can collect the questions and then basically send you uh, the questions and we can answer them uh, via some social media way so thank you so much sir i just like to hand over to uh, jenis madam uh, for further uh, coordination thank you speakers and thank you dr sandish it is indeed rightly said a single conversation with a wise man is worth a month study of books all of us have surely benefited by the knowledge and experience shared by our esteemed panelists we the department of clinical research and incubation center at maimo medical college hope that hosting this event together with the experts has filled in the gaps of our understanding of covid-19 on behalf of the entire maimo family the management faculty and students i thank all our respected speakers for their valuable inputs we thank our executive director dr suchitra nagre madam director for post graduate studies dr jamkar sir principal dr gupta sir director bioethics dr derek sir for your constant support encouragement and guidance thank you dr sandesh for joining us for this session a big thank you to all the viewers maimo medical college talegaon dhabade pune will be hosting many more such informative webinars in the near future we will keep you updated about the same hope to see you all again thank you